<laughs> so, hi, my name is Fiona, I work on Fiona Simpson. Um, I've come to talk to you tonight to report in because for the last seven years, the Brisbane public have supported both my salary and my work. So I thought I'd come and say hi, <laughs> thank you, and tell you what we've been doing with it all. So first of all, PhD from Cambridge, what conversation killer. If you're getting chatted up in the bar and you tell somebody that, game over. <laughs> so, I'm born in Adelaide. <laughs> I am Australian, but I was brought up on the far north coast of Scotland. My dad died when I was 10, and my mother brought four girls up in a widow's pension. I started working full-time when I was 12 years old in petrol stations, washing dishes in the bar, and cleaning out fishing boats full of fish guts and diesel. Um, when I was a teenager, I used to win things like the British Schools Debating Championship, and I got into an awful lot of trouble. So when the headmaster went to expel me, we had a bit of a discussion. And he said, Fiona, you do everything right, and you do everything wrong. We feel you're just a natural rebel. So we'll let you stay on for now. And one of my teachers went down to the local vets and said, please take the stray in off the streets. And they gave me a job. So I worked in the vets, I scrubbed out the lambing pens, I was involved in the operations, and I loved it. And I wanted to go to university and be a vet and work with large animals in the far north of Scotland. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so I did a degree in biochemistry. I went down to the local chemist and asked him what that was, and he said, it's the study of cells and disease. And I thought, great. The um, government in Scotland pays all their students degrees, and they give me a grant to be able to live. And while I was there, I had a good time working full-time through the night in the bars in Edinburgh. So if anybody wants dirty jokes at the end of the show, I have them. <laughs> so I did quite well at Edinburgh, and I ended up being offered a PhD at Cambridge. So the state school chick from the farms ended up doing her doctorate at Cambridge. OK, yeah, darling. And I did quite well there, too. I discovered the things that give your eyes and your skin and makes all the color in your body and the pathway that does that. And that led to an entire field in melanoma research and um, melanoma cancer, because the proteins involved in your eye color and your freckles are also the proteins involved in that pathway. So I was working in basic cell ideas of how things happen and how things move around. Um, I did quite well at Cambridge, so I got a Wellcome Trust Fellowship to go to California. And I went and spent three great years in San Diego. My mother was very proud, as you can imagine. And while I was there, I got pregnant with my first daughter. I phoned home. I said, Mum, Mum, I'm six weeks pregnant. And she went really quiet, and I thought, oh, she's not happy with me. And then she said, I'm really sorry, Pet. I've just been told I have six weeks to live. So she had lung cancer. She'd never smoked. She'd never drank. She couldn't afford to on a widow's pension with four girls. And she managed to make it a full year. When we got the results back, the tumor had actually gone down through the diaphragm under her lungs and sealed around it, which was quite miraculous. But she met my daughter, Rachel, before she died. So I left the States. I had a choice of going back to the cold in the UK or coming to Brisbane. So I looked to see where Brisbane was on the map, and I thought, yeah, Barrier Reef, sunshine, I'll go there. That was in the year 2000. I've been here 18 years. This accent is not going away. <laughs> I worked here in diabetes research, and um, then um, in about 1998, I had my son, Ewan. I was working 16 hours a day on a full-time fellowship, and I left science, because everybody thinks you're Wonder Woman, you're running the kids, you're doing the science, and I weighed 30 kilograms when I left that job. I recovered for eight months, and then I went back to the Translational Research Institute at the PA Hospital, which is the University of Queensland um, Diamantina Institute. And there I met another Australian that has a really strange accent called Ian Fraser, 
who invented the Gardasil vaccine. And Ian went through my track record and he offered me my own research lab. I was lucky enough to have an NHMRC CDF fellowship. And so I set up a group and my question was cancer. So we went to the oncologists at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and we said, what's the problem? And they said, well, here's one of our problems. We give an antibody, a protein to the patients called cetuximab in head and neck cancer. In breast cancer, they use antibodies like Herceptin for HER2 positive breast cancer. In head and neck, when you give all the patients eligible cetuximab, 15% of them respond, 85% of them get side effects with no benefit, and it costs the taxpayer about $60,000 per patient. So the question that we had is, can we predict which patients will respond? We did it a little differently. We didn't use cells, we didn't use animals. We went to the PA hospital and some very brave gentlemen with head and neck cancer and a couple of ladies volunteered to let us take live biopsies of tumors from their throats. We took live tumor samples, ran back to the lab and did our experiments on the live human tumors. And what we found was that in patients where the target of the antibody was stuck in the surface, they did better. And the ones that were normally taking it inside the cell, they did worse. It was completely the opposite from anything I'd ever learned in 20 years of science, and it was completely opposite to the literature. But we had 100% correlation with patient outcome. Now, I couldn't get any of the pharma companies interested in developing the prediction, because it would have cost them 85% of their sales. And that's just commercial reality. So, looking at that, I come from the labs which move things around cells. So we thought, well, if the guys with the target stuck on the top get the response, and the other patients that are still moving the protein don't, why don't we just change the patterns and make them all into responders? It's just a coincidence that the lab I worked in in America identified exactly the protein that could do that, and I had all the inhibitors in the fridge that I brought with me from the States. So we tried it out. First of all, it worked. It brought immune cells in on the tumors. It's something called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. I went to the head offices of the pharma companies and explained all this. They said, that's not how it works. It was designed to inhibit signaling, and I said, it's the immune system. They told me I was a crazy mad woman. Five years later, across the scientific literature, it's absolutely accepted that the response to these antibodies is the immune system. And the reason we kept going when everybody told us we were wrong is because our data was reproducible every single time. So we decided to ignore everybody and follow what our experiments said. So then we had a problem. The molecule that we're trying to inhibit is one called dynamin. It also controls synaptic vesicle recycling in your neurons. And everybody said, you cannot inhibit this molecule in human beings. It will be too harmful. At 3 o'clock one morning, a lawyer who was volunteering his time in Sydney on the phone to help me with a slide presentation for a company sent me a single slide. It showed a molecule that's in clinic, which has a side effect of inhibiting dynamin. The molecule's been used in humans for 60 years. Its proper name is prochlorperazine. Most of you will know it as stematol. There's a few smiles there. Lots of people take stematol. They take it for travel sickness. They take it for nausea. At high concentrations, it's used as an antipsychotic. And some people take daily doses of stematol for 60 years because it's a dopamine receptor inhibitor. But if you use it at high enough concentrations, it inhibits dynamin and moves things around. So we tested it in mouse models. It's the first animal work I've done in 30 years of science, but you have to test it in an animal before you test it in a human being. That's just ethical. And we put in these really resistant tumors that never get affected by the antibodies. And when we added the stematil, the tumors disappeared. And when we looked at the animals, they also didn't have any metastasis either. So we had to go to humans. We went to phase one. We had gentlemen and one lady volunteer in the clinic for phase one, no 
benefit trial. They were end stage metastatic cancer. They had maybe six to eight weeks left to live. And everybody told us we would never be able to recruit them for the trial. And we had four volunteers in four weeks. My um, partner is an evil lawyer, and he argues that nobody ever does anything, even charity, unless it gives them something. And when I went home and told him about our patients, he said, that's the first altruistic thing I've ever seen in my life. Science wins. <laughs> so, so we did the test. And what we did was we gave them high dose. We took a tumor biopsy from these guys who were very nervous. Then we gave them a high dose IV, delivery of stematol, much higher than any concentration any of you would have taken. And we took another biopsy, and we could show the receptor moving around. It's the first time on the planet anybody's moved a drug target in a tumor, and it's happened here at the PA hospital. Our lab's nearly shut down four times. We've been within two weeks of closing twice. We've been saved by the Nunda Rotary International, sausage sizzles. We've been rescued by Cancer Council Queensland. Thank you, everybody who's ever bought a daffodil. We've been rescued by the National Breast Cancer Foundation because this target is an 80% of triple negative breast cancer patients. And we can also apply this to her septum in her too. When we went to go to clinical trial, we approached the drug company that makes the antibody. They didn't want to help us or give us the drug because they have new drugs in the pipeline. It's not our science, it's not our clinical data, because we are working with them on their new pipeline antibodies, but they wouldn't give us the old one coming off patent. So we were stuck. We couldn't go to the phase 1B safety combination trial. And the PA Hospital Research Foundation stepped forward with their corporate sponsors. So all the seniors who are in the Aveo Aged Care ran lots of teas for us across Queensland. Allied Leisure and Health ran lots of piss-ups and pubs for us. And Coca-Cola donated some of their vending machine profits. They gave us $250,000, and we started the trial in 10 patients. We're just finishing the dose escalation now. It's turned out to be completely safe. And unexpectedly, on a phase 1B safety, we've had signs that it's going to work. My problem, and I've come to you because you've paid for all of this, is that our next step is to go to phase two. That costs $5 million to get all the work done. Now, we've had venture capitalists and other companies looking at it, but Stematil is a generic drug and it's cheap. And they can only make maybe sevenfold return on their money and not tenfold. So, we have a commercial issue. And when I talk to people, they pat me on the head and they say, oh, it's all about money. You really have to understand this. Now, I think nobody told me when they said fix cancer in these patients that they remembered to tell me it had to make a bunch of people money. So we can give up now, but we can't. My lab are amazing. They've stuck with me, even though we've nearly shut down a few times. And why we can't is because those patients who volunteered for the trials and their families all expect us to keep going. And I'm pretty sure you guys who've paid for it do too. So I leave you with the thought that while everybody says it's about the money, some of us still believe it's about the patients. Thank you.